15. Anybody got anything different? Or Five? I didn't get, so I didn't get as far as I thought, did I? We'll go back to five. That's fine. Not a problem. How many of you know somebody needs to keep the pastor straight sometimes? Romans. Romans. <laughs> well, he hadn't been in here with us. So, you know, he's been... But it's good to have you, JT. Even though you didn't know where we were, that's okay. <laughs> it's good to have a younger head in here every now and then. <laughs> Amen. All right, chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 5 then, okay? We've been talking about being dead to sin and alive in Christ, and that's exactly what happens to us when we get saved. Uh, once again, it's the symbolism of baptism when you're go down under, you're, you die to sin and you come up a new man in Christ or a new woman in Christ and you come up alive and you're no longer dead. Praise God for that. That's a, I know we hear that all the time, but that's a really neat thing uh, that we are no longer dead and death has no hold or grip over us any longer. Okay? Verse 5 says, For if we have been united with him in death like this, like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So what is he saying now? We've died with him. We've been buried to sin. Now just as he arose from the grave and because he came back to life and he's alive today, one day the same thing's going to happen to all of us. So death, as we just said a moment ago, has no, no hold over us at all. And he did all of this for us now, being buried, dying, being buried, and then arising again. He did every bit of that as a sample for us that that's what's going to happen to us when we come to know him, okay? For we know in verse 6 that our old self was crucified with him. So what about us has been crucified? Our sin, this old fleshly body, which is sinful, okay? Not our soul and not our spirit, but this old fleshly body because he is going to save our spirit. But all of that's got to die so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. And what we're just saying, this, this body you're living now, it, it one day it's going to go. It's got to go because of sin, all right? Everything that sin has touched and taken a hold of has got to go. That's why one day not only will you get a new body, but there will be a new heaven are you kidding me? And a new earth. Okay? There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Why a new heaven? Isn't that where Satan was? Isn't that where he sinned and had the pride come into his heart? So the old heaven has to be done away with and there will be a new heaven, a new earth, and you will have a new body. And I say praise God for the new body, as always. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. It's an interesting thing when you, when you stop and think about it. The Bible talks a lot about being a slave to something, doesn't it? We're either a slave to sin or we're a slave to God. All right? um, and as long as we're a slave to sin, we are facing death. Okay, Death, death is before us, but once we become alive to Christ, then we no longer have to face that. All right, But we, are, we need to understand clearly the Bible is clear. He teaches us that we're free, but we're free from slavery to sin. It then puts us what? In a position of slavery to God. All right? We commit, our, but we do that willingly, right? That, is that not what we want? We don't like the term slave, do we? We don't even like the term servant, probably. But Jesus Christ himself said he came to do what? To serve. All right? So who are we not to serve? That, that's the point. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin, so we're set free to be what? A slave to God. All right? Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And it's really important that we know that and understand that and believe that about ourselves, okay? 
I've told you before, and we've talked about this before. I've I've seen a number of people die in, in this from this world, um, and it, it's amazing to me the difference when a Christian passes away versus the difference when a sinner passes away. And it's it's not a pretty picture for someone who doesn't know God. I mean, so think about it. Someone who believes there's nothing after this life, you just die and you're gone, and that's it, never to exist anymore. Uh, that's sort of a sad situation in it or knowing somebody their sinful life and knowing that they have not given their heart to God and knowing where someone is going who has rejected God that's a pretty sad situation in it and it's it's totally different for a Christian we we should have no fear whatsoever of physical death because it what does the Bible tell us it cannot hold us okay and that's why Jesus talks about falling asleep. Paul talks about falling asleep. Uh, you know, he said Lazarus was not dead. He was just asleep. He, he mentioned that, I think, about one other one. Okay? Uh, so when we die, we don't die completely. We're not completely gone, all right? There is more for us. There is hope for us because Jesus Christ died. That's important to know. Aren't you glad that you know that? Because we're all going to face that day one day, right? Unless the Lord comes and takes us home, which would be a great thing if we all went home together, wouldn't it? But unless he does that, we're all going to face that moment. Now, we can be real brave about it right now and say, oh, that's not going to bother me and blah, 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 and so forth and so on, but none of us are facing it right now, are we? I don't know of anybody in here that's facing that right at this moment. And that the doctors told you you've got 24 hours or a week or anything like that. Uh, but that day's coming. That day's coming. So get it in your head right now that you don't have to be afraid of that. That's not something that you have to worry about if you've got God in your heart. Always remember what he has waiting for you. Always remember that it's better than where you are right now. <laughs> It's going to be a whole lot better than where you are right now. now you know, if, if you understand God's blessing and God's love for you, you understand that, right? You understand that it's going to be a whole lot better than where we are now. So it should not be anything that brings about any fear to us. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death will never grab him again. Now, he did die. Okay? He, he had to die because he had to conquer it, right? Now, how is he going to conquer it if he didn't actually die? So he had to die. So don't let anybody tell you he, he, he wasn't dead. He was absolutely dead. One of the reasons we know that is when the Romans put, put the spear in his side, water and blood came out. That's the sign of death, right? That's the sign of a dead person. So we know that he died. So he actually died, but he overcame that death. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. Now, what does that mean? The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The Bible teaches very clearly that when he died on the cross, God made him sin so that what? What was the purpose in doing that? So that he could crucify all sin on the cross. All sin for those who have believed in him or who would come to believe in him. So when you come to believe in him, your sin has been already taken care of on the cross. One time. Now why would he mention to a bunch of uh, Romans or, and, and even he, and a bunch of Jews, why would he say to them he did it once for all? What were they used to? What were the Jews used to? Killing all these animals over and over and over and over again to do what? To atone for sin, to take away their guilt. Uh, to satisfy God, uh, at least for a time. But the Bible's very clear, the blood of bulls and, boats, bulls and goats could not save people, really, okay? It was just being done till what happened? Well, Jesus shed his blood, so one time, he did it one time, and that was good enough. His blood was powerful enough to cover all sin for all time. That's some power, folks. I think I've said this to you before, but you think about how many sins you've committed. Now, don't look at the person next to you, but then think about how many sins they've committed, <laughs> okay? And the one behind you. 
And then think about all of those who live in your neighborhood. Then think about all of those who live in the state of Georgia then expanded the United States and the world and all of those who've gone on before. And think about all of that sin. Good night. That's exhausting, isn't it? That's a whole bunch of sin. Christ's blood was powerful enough to cover every bit of it. All right? And he will cover our sins if we come to him and believe in him. The death he died, verse 10 again, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now remember, Christ had no sin. But God made him sin. Okay? He had to make him sin for it to help us. You get that? For it to crucify all sin for all time. So he, so he had to do that. So when he did that, he broke the power of sin forever over those who would come to believe in him. Sin has no power over you. Then why do we sin? We, could, we choose to, but the biggest reason is this, because we live in this fleshly body which we still struggle. How many of you know you're struggling with your fleshly body all the time? You're struggling with this mind, aren't you? This fleshly mind. We struggle with it all the time. Okay? This fleshly body has desires 24-7. Am I right? Your mind is working 24-7. I mean, I think mine works when I'm asleep half the time. Because sometimes it wakes me up. Does it ever do that to you? <laughs> Thinking about something or worrying about something or considering something or having a, a bad dream or something that's on your mind. I mean, I don't know. It's just all kind of stuff going on. It's all the time. 24-7 desires, 24-7 thoughts, right? So we need Christ. We needed him to die so that we could do what? We could have power over that. And you have him in you. You have the spirit in you, so you have power over that. So we are without excuse. When we sin, we are without excuse. Okay, because God has given us what we need to overcome any sin that may come to our minds or into our thoughts or any desire that this body may be craving. God has given us what we need to overcome that. Sadly, we don't depend on that enough, do we? And that's when we sin. The Bible's very clear. We sin when what? We start thinking about something, looking at something. And, and we build on that and build on that and continue to think about it and look at it and whatever else. And, and then it turns into a full-blown sin because we don't get it off our minds and our hearts, right? So what's the answer? Exactly. Exactly. Don't keep pondering it. Okay? If a, a thought like that comes into your mind, get rid of it. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? Take it captive and turn it over to Jesus Christ. We just don't practice that enough sometimes. We, we got to think it over and over and over. And this even is affected by attitudes we have with other people. I mean, that's a part of it. You know, we get to disliking somebody and what happens? We start finding all kinds of things wrong with them, don't we? Instead of stopping it right at the very beginning, we, start, we continue to find all kinds of things wrong with them and we build it up in our minds to what? It almost becomes a hate. And I think sometimes it does. And we're talking about with Christian people, folks, and we don't have any right to hate people. God has not put that in us. What has God put in us? Love. Love for people. So we are, again, without excuse. If we don't have the right attitudes, if we don't get sin out of our lives, we are without excuse. Yes, Ken. Oh, that's yeah. I I think it's it's good sometimes that we see who we are though, and what our, what our problem is, and we realize our problem that we have sinned, uh, because we can get forgiveness for it at that point. If you don't realize you've sinned, and you don't think you've done wrong, and you're not so bad, and all of that, then you may not come to God with it. You know, uh, you may not see the need to come to God with it. So I think that I think that when we sin, I think guilt is a good thing. I think, it, I think it needs to wear us out to we'll come back to God. But it would be good if we would repent as soon as we can and really repent from our heart 
And repentance is, we've told you so many times, and you already know this, repentance means to make a change. Turn and go in another, get away, that's putting away the sin, right? And moving in another direction. Yes, Jeff. Yes. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely he does. The problem is sometimes, the sad part is sometimes we don't take the way out. We don't follow the way out. We still pursue what we want. Why is it important for us to talk about this among a group of Christian people? I mean, you wouldn't think this would be such a subject to be talked about among Christian people. Well, I think we all know the answer to that, don't we? Because we all struggle with this. Because we're all still in these fleshly bodies that have those desires and those thoughts. And it is a battle every day, isn't it? It is a battle every day. But folks, it's a battle we can win. Thanks be to Jesus Christ who gives us the victory. And I want to just keep impressing that upon your mind. It is a battle we can win. In this life, we don't have to wait till we're dead and in heaven. We can win the battle right here, but it's a battle we got to fight. All right? And we got to do it God's way. We got to do it God's way. We cannot ponder things wrong. We cannot look upon wrong sin and, and just keep looking upon it. We got to we got to get rid of it. We got to let it go. And we got to look to God. And that's what he's saying here, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Think about that one. Chew on that for a little bit. And look at your own life. It's a good time for reflection, I think. Is the life you're living, is every decision you're making, everything you're doing, is it living to God? Or is it living to what you want? Stop in a moment let you chew on that one. Okay? Because it's something you need to think about and consider and really get serious about. Everything we do ought to be lived to God. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that, what we are, isn't that what you want as a Christian? Is that your desire as a Christian? To live totally to God? I think sometimes we, we get defeated because we see the almost impossibility of that, or that's the way we look at it. We think it's an impossible task. So we don't maybe not sometimes put as much effort into it as we ought to. Uh, in the same way, verse 11 says, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Folks, when, when he says count yourselves, he means to see yourselves in this light, okay? As dead to sin, but alive to God. That's the way you ought to view yourself. That's what you ought to tell yourself. I'm dead to sin, okay? And I want to live to God. This is the reality of a Christian life that we're talking about. This is the real deal that we're talking about in, in a Christian life. It really is something that we need to act on that's already true in what God has done for us. Do you understand what I'm saying? God has already made us righteous. He's already made us pure and holy in our spirit, so that ought to be acted out in our flesh, right? Right? That's the way it works. So it's a reality that's already there, so let's live it. That's the point. Let's live the reality that Christ has already worked in us. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. There it is. Don't let sin control you. And that's where we get in trouble, isn't it? We really need to hear this. This is, this is really important. Do not let any sin control you. so that you obey its evil desires. It's sort of a bad situation to be in for a Christian when we say we want to be obedient to God, but we're being obedient to the devil. And we're being obedient to a sin in our lives or, or an attitude in our lives that, that don't need to be there or whatever.
okay? So it's an action thing here. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body because its desire is to do what? To capture you and control you and keep you from having a relationship with God that you ought to have. That's exactly what Satan wants. So the idea is don't give in to Satan. Don't let Satan have his way. Stay away from sin. And there's, there's a whole gamut of them out there. I mean, I, can't, I don't have time to list them all for you right now. But what you need to do is look in your own heart and your own life and what you're doing, and, and you need to figure it out. And if it's sin, get away from it. Do something different. Follow God in that, whatever God says. Do not, in verse 13, offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. In other words, don't let any part of your body get involved with sin. Keep it all pure. Okay? Keep it all pure, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And listen, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Another word in some translations is the word weapon of righteousness, indicating what again? Action, and that we're fighting a battle. If it's a weapon... Weapons of righteousness are used to do what? Fight against sin. Okay? You know, he talks about the full armor of God in Scripture. We told you before, picture yourself putting each part of that armor on every morning so that you know which part of your body you're protecting and, and what has to be protected. For sin shall no longer be your master, this is verse 14, because you are not under the law, but under grace. People who are under the law, and I think Paul makes this clear, are hopeless. Did you hear what I just said? People who are under the law and feel like they're under the law are hopeless. That's why the Pharisees were hopeless. That's why they couldn't see God when he was standing right in front of them. Okay? They were so bound by the law, they were hopeless. They were hopelessly bound by that law. But with grace, because nobody can live up to the full measure of the law, nobody, grace then gives us victory. Because it's now God's power coming through the grace who helps us to live a righteous life. And that's the only way we can do it. That is the only way we can do it. We'll only live a righteous life as we surrender to God and what God wants for us. If we push our way in any situation in life, we're going we're gonna to lose. Okay? We're not going to have the victory in our hearts and lives that I think we all want to have, right? So it's grace, God's grace, that gives us the victory. So when we accept his grace and we come to believe in him, now we're no longer hopeless. That's what the Bible calls you. you know, we now come out from under the law, and we're under grace, the grace of Jesus Christ. We ought to remember that since we're under the grace of Jesus Christ, we ought to extend grace to everyone else. That's what we need to remember. And that frees us up too. That frees us up spiritually when we do that but if Jesus Christ the son of God is willing to give us grace who are his enemies when we were living in sin if he was willing to extend us grace who are we not to extend anybody grace in this world there, there is nobody in this world that we cannot afford to extend grace to and it's really God's grace that's in us that we're extending right and there's where the power comes in there's where the power comes in. In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under the grace? By no means. And I think he would have, if he would have been speaking that, he would have said that very emphatically. By no means. Listen to me. There is never, God never gives a Christian permission to sin. Now, sinners 
If they want to sin and they've decided to sin and they want to continue to sin, the Bible says he does what? He gives them over to their sin. That's not giving them permission, but he's just turning them over to it and letting them have it because that's what they've chosen and that's what their desire is. But now Christians different, folks. God can't turn you over to sin because you're a Christian. So if a Christian is going to try to sin in this life, what do you think is going to happen? God can't turn you over to it. He can't just let you go in it. Okay, so what, what's going to happen? So if one of maybe two or three things. He's going to, I think he's first going to try to get your attention. And he's going, he, it may take a number of things for him to get your attention, but God's patient. God will work with you and he will try to get your attention and he will try to help you see the wrong in what you're doing and try to get you back in the right frame of mind and back in a right relationship with him. And some of that, as we said before, will be painful. It may be very painful. But then the other thing is this, if you persist in that and you persist in that and you persist in that as a Christian, he may take you out of here. To do what? To stop you from sinning. So, so you won't be a stumbling block to other folks if you're saying you're a Christian and you're sinning. Absolutely. So it's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? It's a very dangerous place to be living. Trying to live in a life of sin when you're a Christian and you, you just can't do that. And I know a lot of folks will question your salvation, and that may be correct. That may be something else you may need to think about if you get caught up in a life of sin. Maybe you need to get saved. Maybe you really need to get into a relationship with Christ. I don't know. That would be something between you and him. But a Christian never has permission to sin. Verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Now listen to what he says next. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which means God, which leads to righteousness. So you may not like the term slave or servant, but you're, you are one whether you're a Christian or a sinner. That's what he's saying. You're a slave to one or the other. Okay? Now, being a slave to sin is going to lead to death and hell. Being a slave to God is going to lead to life and a spot in heaven right with Jesus Christ. I mean, every time I think of this, and I use this term a lot, that to me is a no-brainer, folks. And why people can't see it and understand it, it's just hard for me to figure out I, I don't know they've just Satan's got them so so wrapped up or something I don't know he's got their minds so messed up that they can't see the truth but to me what that's not even a choice when you stop and think about it any sane person I mean would accept that would they not I mean don't think about on this earth if, if I were to offer somebody on this earth a mansion with all the wealth in the world or pleasure for a time in death in an agonizing death which one do you, on this earth do you think if they saw that which one would they choose well it's even a bigger decision for eternity it's even a bigger decision for eternity but people don't see it people don't see it so we're either a slave to sin or a slave to God in righteousness verse 17 says but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. Don't leave that part out. That means it's the real deal. This is what you really, this is your real heart's desire. The pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So here's the idea. We were all slaves to sin at one time. Right? Before we came to God, we were all slaves to sin. So we left that light. We got enlightened. That's a good word, isn't it? We got the light shined in us. 
we saw the light, we believed in the light, and so we were freed from being a slave to sin. So what Paul is trying to tell Christians here is this. Since you've been enlightened and set free, don't go back to being a slave to the darkness and to the sin. Stay clear of it. Stay away from it. Verse 19. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. So that's why it's not a surprise when sinners sin, right? The surprise is when Christians sin. You were free from the control of righteousness when you were a sinner, so you just sinned. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? In other words, when you were living a life of sin, what did all of that do for you? How did it help you? It put you in a bigger, bigger hole, didn't it? That's what Jeff said. It put you in a bigger hole. It put you in more darkness was sending you to hell. That's where you were headed. Okay? What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you were now ashamed of? Things now that, how many of you look back on your past life and you've, you've seen some things you wish you'd never done? It were wrong. Probably every one of us. Probably every one of us have done that. So it was no benefit to you. And now you're ashamed of it, aren't you? But God can take that shame too. Because why? He has forgiven that. He has forgiven all of that. Praise God for that. Do you see how great his forgiveness really is? Do you see how powerful his forgiveness is? Those things result in death. And that means, I think it means death now and eternal death. Okay? Both. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Holiness. What is holiness? The Bible says that God is holy, so what? We are to be holy. So what is holiness? Sanctification... Uh, Helps us grow in holiness. Yes, absolutely. What is holiness? Righteousness, purity. Do what, Canon? Being in line with the truth, living the truth. Anybody else? I, I think if we're going to say we're going to be holy, we ought to understand what it means. It does mean living a righteous life. God makes us holy inside, okay? But then the work comes with us actually putting that holiness into practice, okay? And that's what we struggle with at times. But God calls us to be holy just as he is holy. And that's, I think, again, like sanctification, a moment by moment by moment by moment action in thinking that we, we're becoming holy we are becoming holy in our in our life here on earth so the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life the result of what becoming a slave to God that's it becoming a slave to God leads to eternal life and here's a pretty powerful verse it's also a part of the Roman road it says for the wages of sin is death now when you work at a job you get paid right so you feel like you earn that money right apply that to what he just said for the wages of sin is death <laughs> you earn it you earn death if you sin but the gift of God which means what it's just the opposite you can't earn it you don't earn it. You don't deserve this. It's totally a gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus 
our Lord. And that's what we all have waiting for us. If we know him, we live for him, and we believe in him and who he is. Anybody got any thoughts or comments? We're going to stop there. Yes, Jeff?